when we talk about the Lean Lab, we say like our vision is to create an education innovation hub in Kansas City. We think that we can be the best city for dynamic, progressive educators to come and build new solutions. However, we do think we believe that education needs to be done with community, not done to community. And I think a lot of the reason we've seen a lot of top-down reforms fail is because they've just completely disconnected parents, teachers, and families from solution making. That was Katie Booty, the co-founder and CEO of The Lean Lab. I'm Nathaniel Bozarth, and this is Wide Ruled, Brand Root's podcast on the past and present of equality in education. In today's episode, we're talking with Katie Booty and Aditya Valetti of The Lean Lab, According to their website, the Lean Lab is a Kansas City-based community that launches transformational education innovations that have national impact. In the first part of today's episode, you'll hear Katie tell the story of how the Lean Lab got its start. And in the second, Dietje Valetti joins us to talk about the activism surrounding the highly contested appointment of Betsy DeVos as Secretary of Education, including lots of ideas for what you, the listener, can do to impact education in your state and community. So Katie Booty taught at Alta Vista Charter School, a charter school in Kansas City, Missouri, in its inaugural semester through the Teach for America program. If you're not familiar, Teach for America takes bright, social justice-minded college graduates, often graduates who did not receive a degree in education, and throws them into a summer-long crash course on teaching and on systemic inequality. The Teach for America program is designed to churn out teachers with a special eye towards eliminating gaps in student achievement that tend to run along racial and socioeconomic lines. Here's Katie telling the story of the Lean Lab. And Lean Lab really started as like a monthly brunch crew while I was still at Alta Vista. And I knew at the time that like Kansas City education was hurting, right? Our district just lost accreditation again. Our charter school market was growing, but at that point in time, we hadn't had any like breakout successes. And there was just, I just had this like sense that the way in which we were doing education just wasn't like, wasn't transformative, wasn't up to date, wasn't cutting edge. And the result of that was that our kids just weren't, these achievement gaps, these opportunity gaps just weren't closing. And we were seeing kind of what I call like this, kind of martyr teacher syndrome where we're we're seeing kids achieve at high levels and, you know, break barriers on or, you know, break records on tests, et cetera. It was usually because you had this teacher that was working 100 hours a week and killing themselves after school tutoring, Saturday tutoring, et cetera, et cetera, to try to reach all these kids. And some remark, you know, we have some remarkable, amazing teachers in Kansas City that do this year after year. Um, But it's A, not scalable and B, you know, not sustainable. So the brunch crew continues. They start to hold some events, get some speakers in, really trying to amp things up and propel into action. Then they start to watch the tech community in Kansas City begin to soar, and they get an idea. And um, at the same time, we started hosting these, like uh, the entrepreneurship scene in Kansas City started getting a lot of gaining a lot of momentum, and the tech community too. So. Kind of these things were kind of overlapping at the same time and quickly realized, you know, we had a lot to learn from the entrepreneurial community and the creative community too in Kansas City. Not only were they great at building community, they were also really great at talking about innovation and really had fostered this culture of being able to share bold ideas, fail fast, fail forward, provide support. Fail fast, fail forward is a common mantra in Silicon Valley startups as well as startup communities across the country. Theoretically, This mantra is meant to normalize and even encourage failure as an acceptable route to success, exhorting entrepreneurs to use their failures as both impetus for reinvigorated effort and a learning opportunity in the vein of Thomas Edison when he said, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. And that's kind of when the light bulb moment went off when, oh my God, there are these mechanisms in which you can take an early stage idea, get resources for it like have safe ways to test new ideas and then launch them and thought, well, that could be, that could be the next step that's transformative for Kansas City education is not just to build community, but to also, you know, create mechanisms to actually launch initiatives that can change the whole dynamic. That was back in 2013. Since that time, the Lean Lab has taken three cohorts of education entrepreneurs through their incubator fellowship. Their most recent cohort hosted entrepreneurs from 28 different cities and three countries. 
The Lean Lab has supported 16 educational startups in the four years since their founding. The entrepreneurs who have come through the Lean Lab's doors have invented creative solutions for English language learners, solutions to narrow the gap between teachers and parents, solutions to build relationships between college students and high schoolers, tools to connect businesses to students, and supports for teachers fundraising to purchase supplemental materials and technology for their classrooms. Good thing that came out of this recent division around our new Secretary of Education is that I think people are more engaged and more hungry for information than ever before. The downside is I hope that we don't we didn't get so caught up in arms and miss the point that while you may not agree with her stance and her position, there's so much you can do at a local level to advocate for real change that actually impacts kids in classrooms in your neighborhood right away. And I hope that that energy translates into people becoming um, just much, much more active in their local education communities because there's so there's tremendous amounts of impact you can have at a local level. My conversation with Katie and Aditya turned to political events. On February 7th, 2017, the controversial appointment of Betsy DeVos came down to a tie-breaking vote by Vice President Mike Pence. The DeVos appointment caused a lot of people to protest, a lot of people to call their senators, and a lot of people to take action who had never taken action on education issues before. There seems to just be like a lot of energy and attention focused on, you know, like defending public schools and keeping American education from being destroyed and things That's like that. That's Aditya Valetti, really, really good Director of Community and Partnerships but at like, the Lean Lab. I think, I, I think like all of this energy should be channeled to like, uh, like the state level where like a lot of decisions get made. And there just needs to be like a little bit more of an understanding of like what the Department of Education in DC does and what it's capable of doing. And you know, like one of the things that I find that people don't really talk about or understand is that at the national level, the Department of Education really like incentivizes, like there are a lot of programs where they give grants if states do things or localities do things or, or time money to doing or not doing something. Aditya went on to say that basically the Department of Education is just kind of pushing money around. It's not so much saying do this or do that. It's more like, if you do this, we'll have this money available for you, which is a pretty strong incentive. But at the end of the day, it does leave ultimate decision-making up to the states and even to the local school board. Regardless of this reality, Katie and Aditya had a lot of reason to be excited about people being involved in the politics around education because recent history had shown a conspicuous lack of local involvement with education. Here's Katie. What happened was um, just we couldn't find enough people that wanted to run. And typically what happens when you run for school board, just like any election, you have to get X amount of signatures from your district that say, that that vouch for you, and that gets your name on the ballot, right? And then it goes to election. Um, And people weren't getting signatures. And I don't think it's because people weren't endorsing other people. I think there was just no one really wanted to put the energy into running because either they didn't, you know, it just wasn't a, a... sexy enough position. I don't know if people just don't want to be school board members or if, um, you know, our, our Kansas City Public School Board has been kind of slandered in the media for the last couple of decades. So I don't know if people just felt it came with a certain sort of stigma or what. But unfortunately, that's what happened is that there just weren't enough people that had gone through the process to get on the ballot. Um, and unfortunately, what that meant was that it was a year where there was a lot of board turnover. Four out of the nine Kansas City Public School Board seats were vacant, to be exact. So this was a, a really important election in the sense that, you know, really the whole like entirety of the board makeup was shifting. Um, so and it was, you know, they're shifting from provisional accreditation to trying to get accreditation, about to embark on a new superintendent. So it's like a very, very critical year for strong governance to need to be in place. So so in the absence of those people, um, of people kind of self-appointing themselves to get on the board or go through the process, um, you know, my role just behind the scenes was like trying to find, spread, just spread the word last minute because we didn't get people that get on the ballot, like who might be interested, um, what kind of support might they need, what would, a, what would take writing an effective writing campaign. What does that need to look like? How can we support? So that's really what that ended up looking like. Um, Katie got together with the Kansas City, Missouri mayor's office and put together an ad hoc pack to this end. And, and 
luckily we found, I think, what has become a very dynamic board and I think change is happening. But my frustration being like, that was a very reactive, that was extraordinarily reactive approach <laughs> that I don't think is, and like, and that was just one school board of, again, like the 40 that we have in their region. So, which, and that's just the most visible one, which makes you wonder how often this is happening and how seriously are people taking these positions. For only one of the sub-district seats was a candidate able to find herself a place on the ballot. The other three seats were left to write-ins. According to Ballotpedia, 281 different names appeared among the ballots for those three positions in a local election with only 5% turnout. Who knows how many voters wrote in their own names because they couldn't find out who the would-be candidates were. I wouldn't really blame them. My wife and I, as we walked to the polls that day, had a terribly difficult time finding information about any of the write-in candidates. And we're just citizens on the outside, trying to engage in the democratic process toward a better society. But the struggle for information isn't limited to those on the outside looking in. Teachers sometimes have this issue too. I remember when I was a teacher, like, I didn't even know what was going on in the classroom next door, much less in other schools in the district, much less in other schools in other districts, you know, like you just sort of know your own experience. And even if like, you know, when I speak to parents, they know very much what's going on in the school that their child attends, but it's hard. It's hard to know what's happening on a much more macro level. And keep in mind that macro level could even be defined as like what's happening in other schools in Kansas City, much less like other schools in the state, much less other schools in the nation. Mm -hmm. And so because people just tend to be so siloed, it's also hard to sort of, you know, take a step out and look at the diversity of what's going on and what people's needs are. It's like, uh, why is it, um, like, what, what are teachers and students losing by being siloed? Or what are they missing? I mean, on a basic level, there's that, like, camaraderie and sharing of experiences that, you know, bring people together. So, for instance, I think of, like, my first year teaching, like, a first, your first year teaching experience is typically terrible for like universally for all first yeah. year teachers but you can feel like it's such an alienating experience because you are alone with you know my instance like 70 children every day and right. like and uh, it's or when, 200 or, in mine yeah, yeah and you don't any you, if you've just had the opportunity to get together people with those similar experiences and learn and realize that like it's not just you it's the nature of just being a beginner again and there are tips and tricks and, you know, traits of the profession that you can share. Um, I think that's just one basic element, like being able to norm and share best practices. Teaching is one of those, I think, professions, unlike that's, it's harder to build that in intentionally because you are with the children all day. And when you don't have, t when you have time outside your classroom, it's typically like planning or doing things that just have to get done versus really bettering your, your practice. So. Yeah, basically. I mean, one of the things that we sort of uh, think about and push this like don't reinvent the wheel which like when you are siloed becomes like a huge threat right like take the time to research and see what's going mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. because uh, like oftentimes it might just be that someone else is doing it already and you don't have to reinvent the wheel and recreate this like whole program for yourself mm -hmm. um, and that's something that's like a huge you know that's just like a huge um, issue in a very very siloed landscape or field is that like people reinvent the wheel constantly um, yeah, that's a great point oftentimes like i mean things get better when people have more information right mm -hmm. i mean it's like that's why we're all in education because we believe that education empowers mm -hmm. and gives agency and therefore like if you're siloed and therefore don't have knowledge on what's mm -hmm. going on then you are just less empowered as an individual within the system to act in an effective way for the record that was an amazing meta moment of bringing us back to the point. Why are we educators unless we believe in some high mission that we're accomplishing by educating students, supplying them with useful, applicable information, and empowering them for life? But we need to apply those rules to ourselves as teachers. Great point. So, like, what's your best advice for teachers like that to so they don't end up reinventing the wheel, like sitting there, you know, spinning their wheels trying to figure out better way to do what they're doing. I mean, I think on a basic, yeah. I mean, there's, our monthly meetups are a great place to meet other people, but. No, but really, if you're in the Kansas City area, I highly recommend going to the Lean Labs monthly meetups. They happen every third Thursday at 5.30 p.m. at the EduHub, which is located in Westport, Kansas City, Missouri. 
They do this really cool unconference model where there's some general comments, lots of time for networking, connecting with other people. There's beer and snacks provided. Then if there's a topic you'd really like to talk about, you can add it to the board at the front of the room, assign a location to it, and you're sure to gather some people interested in weighing in on your topic. And if you're not in the KC area, or the drive to Westport is too far, you do just like Katie and start your own brunch club to start having these conversations and moving into action. Okay, back to Katie on ways to not be an isolated teacher. I would have killed for something like teacher paid teachers when I was in in the classroom where you can go online and just look up. Um, it's teachers who are sharing their lesson plans who, and they get rated and, materials, and they get and materials yeah. and yes. get paid. It's a way for them to get extra income and people can, you know, pay for or buy their their master plans. That's teacherspayteachers.com. You can find a link to the website in the show notes at brainroot.tv slash wide ruled podcast. I mean, Twitter is actually a great resource for teachers. So if you hashtag mo m o ed chat and uh, hashtag KC edu is uh, they have there's monthly and weekly education chats on Twitter. Those are just yeah. our regional ones you can look up. I mean, if you want to look up project based learning or STEM, I'm sure there's probably even a middle school math one. You could find it. And, you know, teachers are when in the absence of having like a physical space or time to collaborate and building, they're finding other ways or hacking it together via Twitter and other online tools. So like there are yeah. there are ways. Right. <laughs> and I would also say, I mean, try and somehow get people into your classroom as much as possible. You know, like you feel very vulnerable, especially if your classroom isn't where you want it to be, but literally having someone in there for 20 minutes who you then just like meet up afterwards and they're like, oh, here are like certain things that I saw and here's like things you can do right away to fix it. So like, so like a mentor or like a more veteran teacher. Right, or literally just anyone, okay. honestly. <laughs> because I mean, this sort of speaks to the silos. I mean, I'm not joking when I say like, I could teach for weeks and months at a time and no one and no one would be there, yeah. right? You know, but if that is the case, like find someone to be there and just to see what you're see what's going on from an objective viewpoint, like from a back corner, so that you can get help that way. You know. Okay, zooming out again to policy, because Katie and Aditya are so in tune with what's going on in the K twelve landscape, I really wanted to get some practical actions for any listener who is interested in organizing or advocating for some education policy or goal organized toward an issue or an action, whether it be yeah. like to advocate, so either at your school board level or at a state level, whatever makes more sense. So if you are really pro or against expansion of charter schools, for instance, and mobilize your community to make sure that that position is heard. Um, uh, what, I mean, school funding is one as well. You know, if that's a serious concern when you're state budgets being drawn together, advocate, find a way to get, you know, if it's 100, 200 concerned teachers, parents, and superintendents writing a collective letter and making, you know, getting on the bus to go to Jeff City or your capital, whatever it is, when that needs to be heard, you know, take the steps to do so and organize um, is one way. Or again, like with the school board issue, run yourself, you know, be the, <laughs> be the decision maker. <laughs> I mean, I also think uh, like, you know, one of the other things is just um, if you have a school connection, like be, like be involved in it, you know, like there are a lot of so many schools have open door policies and, you know, and also like quite frankly, like a lot of schools just have to let you in if your child goes there anyway. So like just do it, you know, like show up like um, if you're concerned about something like talk to talk to the people at your school about it, you know, like say like, hey, like I want to know more about this or whatever. I mean, just like meet with the actual people and, and talk about things that you care about and uh, see if you can do a collective action or mm -hmm. figure out, you know, like where you would need to go to do that. If you like know a teacher, like go talk to them, you know, like there are people who can help you out. Um, it's just up to you to just show up and talk. Yeah. Katie and Aditya added that on the whole, school governance policy is one of the most transparent forms of democracy we have in the U.S. Case in point, you can go to your local school board meetings. You can read agendas and proceedings online in detail. Going to your local school board meeting is a great way to keep up with what's happening and to get your voice heard. The Missouri education formula hasn't been fully funded for years. So this isn't, now who, I can't, I can't project the future and say that, you know, 
Greitens. She's referring to newly elected Missouri Governor Eric Greitens. Greitens' current, you know, projections for budget will put us in a similar situation as Kansas was in. I don't know, but I do know that, you know, we are in a situation where schools haven't been fully funded for some time. Um, Greitens has made education a very key, like it's one of his key points and positions he wants to, I think, have a legacy behind. Um, so whether you agree with his positions or not, I think there could be potential for a listening ear there to get in on the ground floor to make an impact. But I mean, unfortunately, we're in a region, both Kansas and Missouri, where school funding has not been extraordinarily prioritized <laughs> for some time. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that has to be the case forever, but I do think it does take more people thinking outside of the box on how to get much needed resources into schools and to keep them into schools. Um, but it, because it is, because the nature of it is so complex, unfortunately, there's not one quick solve. Hmm. Yeah. How does that impact your work at the Lean Lab? I part mean, of the reason you're here. <laughs> on a ba on a basic level, like you know, there are there are other states like California and Denver that have innovation line items in their school budget, and every school has a certain amount of money that they can spend specifically on innovation. Or in California, they have specific line items that they can spend on the social emotional well being of their children. And these are services that I think are beneficial to kids. At the end of the day, you want your teachers to be able to be professionalized, to, to invest in R&D. Education is one of the only industries in the nation where we invest only a fraction of 1% on R&D. And I mean, like, if you wonder why we're not having the breakthrough um, successes in education or why we're falling behind other industrial na nations, well, maybe it's because we're not really investing, literally we're not investing in what the future of education should look like. So there's that. And then if you look at the social emotional funds that are provided in other states, um, like there's also this other thing of like, what what if we could dream beyond just providing the bare basics of our, for our kids, namely like transportation and books and teachers, which is pretty much what we provide mm -hmm. now. Like if, we're going to rethink how we fund schools. We should think about it in a more holistic manner or what would really push the needle forward for the education sector as a whole versus just fixating on like the deficits we currently have. When I'm out trying to find the pain points that people feel, um, you know, trying to figure out like, you know, what are the most pressing concerns that you have in education right now? Like so much of it, you know, really comes from like what is not prioritized in the funding formula like what schools just do not prioritize funding and it is so much about the socio-emotional you know learning of children it's it's about can we do more than just having kids like get to school and having them memorize facts like can we do more than that can we really like help shepherd them into like an adulthood that they find you know like meaningful where they have agency and um at the basic level i mean you know we do our best and work very hard to empower education entrepreneurs to address those issues. Um, it would be nice to have help from the school funding side as well. I mean, yeah. but I think that speaks to like why we do exist as an independent yeah. nonprofit outside of the norm. Because like, yeah. if there was, if education was investing in innovation and R and D at the rate of like big industry, like Google, who has their own innovation lab and all the big all the big tech companies that do, then there wouldn't be a need for us, you know? Yeah. But we're an industry that doesn't. So so in that absence is why we exist and why we're, you know, a, a public charity and, and, and that's how we're funded rather than a government agency. So. so that's why the Lean Lab has recruited education entrepreneurs for their incubator fellowship for the past three years. They hope that entrepreneurship in the education sector will lead to reform and renewal across the education system. This method of innovation lies in slight contrast to what was put forward in episode one by Brian DeLiesel and his grassroots group of teachers who believe that the most sustainable and systemic change is gonna come from full-time teachers in the classroom, not teachers turned entrepreneurs. Together, the Lean Lab and Grassroots represent two different though not incompatible theories on what's going to bring the most and best change in American education. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Wide Ruled. Part of the reason that this podcast exists is to highlight innovation that is happening around the country so that you, the listener, won't be isolated as a teacher, 
a concerned parent, or an engaged citizen. To see the work cited for this episode or to find links to resources mentioned, go to our website at brainroot.tv slash wideruledpodcast. And if you like what you've heard, please rate us on iTunes and share this episode. My name is Nathaniel Bozarth. I produce this podcast with executive producer Christopher Cook. This episode is dedicated to my friend Kyle. Thanks for listening.